asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. A great pleasure to welcome back to the programme an honourable man, a man who served his country with distinction in the US Marines and the US Army JAG Corps. He's uh, known these days, though, as a member of the Virginia State Senate, distinguished member of the Virginia State Senate. We often see him on RT on these shores talking about these very important issues. Let's welcome back to the programme Senator Richard Black. Senator, thanks for taking the time out to speak to us today. How are you? I'm doing fine, Richie. It's good to hear from you. Um, I, I noticed that uh, that YouTube has started to uh, censor your show, which uh, is a pretty good indication that it's telling the truth about a whole lot of things that the deep state doesn't like to hear. Oh, well, thanks for, oh, thanks. Thanks for saying thanks that, for Senator. Saying yeah, that. One, of yeah. The, one of the things that the program does is just give a platform to learned men and women like yourself and... Uh, yeah, it, it doesn't suit certain people. We did have a YouTube channel deleted. We've got another one now and we're trying to build it up again. But thank you for saying that. Really good to have you back on. And I meant it when I described you as an honourable man. Senator, tell me this. If the International Atomic Energy Agency says clearly that Iran is not in violation in any way of the deal signed in 2015, why then is Donald Trump saying that it's time to dispense with the deal, to tear it up because it's no good. Why is he doing that? Well, he had made he had made a campaign promise that he was going to do it. He was very critical of it. Um, sometimes political campaigns uh, cause nations to do things that are are irrational and bizarre. Um, while I, you know, I support uh, quite a number of the things that uh, the president does domestically, uh, the foreign policy is still dominated by the deep state. Um, you might recall that uh, when uh, President Obama was elected, uh, there was a large coalition of anti-war activists who were a part of his election. And, uh, and and then uh, people were so excited that they, they gave him the Nobel Peace Prize uh, before he had, uh, I don't know whether he'd even taken office yet. And, uh, uh, but in any event, they gave it to him before he'd had any chance to do anything. And as it turned out, uh, very quickly, the deep state took control and he ended up with one of the bloodiest uh, presidencies in our history. And I worry that we are uh, embarked on a very similar path uh, under President Trump, who campaigned, with the exception of, of his declaration to get out of the Iran nuclear deal, all of his other campaign promises uh, were aimed at the, uh, at the people who are sick and tired of endless wars. Um, and he has reversed his position on all of the, all of the peaceful things. And uh, the one that he has maintained throughout was his determination to end the, the Iran nuclear deal. Um, it, it's very problematic in many ways because uh, it's not just a deal between the United States and Iran but uh, it involved uh, Great Britain, it, it involved France, it involved uh, Germany, uh, China, Russia, uh, the European Union. And the whole thing ultimately was blessed by uh, the United Nations in Resolution 2231, uh, in which they put their seal of approval on the whole thing. Um, and since then, uh, the, uh, the uh, Atomic Energy Commission has gone in and, and they have said that, uh, that Iran has been in rather diligent compliance in every respect with the deal. 
And while the deal is often criticized, uh, the fact is that uh, it required uh, Iran to get rid of 97% of its nuclear material, uh, shut down uh, its only uh, heavy water reactor, and uh, you know, and and I think Iran uh, was very sincere about their uh, compliance with the deal. How influential then is Israel and the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu? And when, when speaking about him, I suppose since we last spoke, I think we last spoke late last year. Recently, of course, Trump appointed as his national security advisor um, the neocon legend, I suppose, to give him that title, John Bolton. How influential are people like that on Trump and on decisions like the one he made yesterday? Well, they're very important. Uh, the uh, Honestly, the, the number one foreign policy objective of the United States is to support and implement uh, Israel's foreign policy. Uh, we can't we can't even defend our own southern border, uh, but uh, we're willing to spend uh, seven trillion dollars go go seven trillion dollars into debt uh, in order to carry out uh, the uh, agenda. Uh, of Israel, and uh, and I think that's unfortunate. I mean, I, I support Israel's right to exist under its internationally uh, recognized borders, but uh, uh, you know, Israel has this intense uh, antagonism towards Iran, and <clears throat> whether they like them or not, the fact is that. Uh, Iran, uh, you know, the difference from from Tel Aviv to uh, Tehran is approximately uh, 1,600 kilometers or about 1,000 miles away. Uh, This is a tremendous, tremendous distance. Um, uh, Iran has never uh, taken any offensive action towards uh, towards Israel. Um, and yet Israel is incessantly uh, bombing, assassinating, uh, you know, they've attacked across the, the Lebanese border back in uh, 2006. That's the most recent one, although there have been a number of of uh, cross-border attacks by Israel against Lebanon, um, and uh, what do we do yeah. about them? Sorry to interrupt you, Senator. This is really important. What do you do about Israel? I said for years, as I mean, I'm a commentator first and foremost, a journalist secondary, but a commentator. And I've said for years, look, I would support a two-state solution pre-1967 borders. Um, shared Jerusalem. Uh, you know, I think you and I would agree on a lot there. It doesn't matter. I, I, you know, I, I put the biblical stuff to one side, the historic stuff to one side, and I say, look, for the sake of peace, pre-67, and you said something very important there. You said that you support Israel's right, right to exist so long as it, you know, abides by and it um, adheres to the, the the international law, but of course it doesn't do that. What would you, if you were given a magic wand, this might be a bit unfair to ask you, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Um, we, 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 we're like old friends now, I think I can ask you this. What would you do, uh, Richard? What, what, what Would you punish Israel? I mean, when, when a so-called regime anywhere else in the world does something that offends the international order of things, we can't wait to cripple the country with sanctions and punishments. There are those listening to this who would say, if Israel continues to commit the crimes it does, violating sovereign borders, doing these things you described, surely they should be punished. What's the point of constantly saying, oh, here's another resolution against Israel's behaviour, here's another statement condemning it. At some stage, somebody's going to have to do something about Israel. And I don't mean militarily. Go ahead. 
Well, I, I don't know that I have a good answer for that uh, <clears throat> because uh, I, I, doubt, uh, I doubt that uh, we're going to, uh, to see anything significant. I, although I, I, I regret that we took the step that we did with, uh, with uh, Jerusalem. Uh, I think I think the situation in Jerusalem was was almost optimal, where uh, there was an ability for people of various faiths to go and to worship there. Um, and I think, to some extent, it, what we've done is little more than a stick in the eye uh, that was unnecessary. Um, I I do think that it would be appropriate for us to to urge restraint on Israel uh, when it's dealing with uh, with uh, the uh, the uprisings uh, over in in uh, in in. Uh, you know, on on their uh, Mediterranean border, where you know they've you know they've killed about fifty protesters and and yes. wounded, I think, over fifteen hundred. Honestly, I may be missing something, and there may be something obvious that I'm missing, but I'm not aware of any situation in any country, any any halfway civilized country, where 1,500 protesters have been shot. I, and, you know, it's one thing when you're talking about a war and you've got, you, you know, you've got armies on two sides, but when you have protesters and you have 1,500 of them shot and simply no criticism, um, nothing but encouragement, and uh, yeah. to yeah. me that that just seems like going too far because um, you know we're always talking about how we should uh, we should allow protesters and how that's part of their freedom of speech and this sort of thing, and uh, <clears throat> and then you know you have this this massively violent reaction over there and I, I think that was unfortunate but uh, uh, I, I do think that we need to maybe rather than rather than doing something that uh, you know is directed at Israel I think what we need to do is we need to carry out exactly the other promises that Trump made during the campaign first to to stop this foolish um, increase in in provocation towards Russia and new, and normalize relations with Russia. The next thing is we need to stop supporting terrorists in their effort to topple the government of Syria. Let me ask you a question there, Sam. Let me just yeah. remind our audience, by the way, we're delighted to welcome back to the programme uh, Virginia State Senator uh, Richard Black, a highly decorated um, military veteran as well, and veteran of the JAG Corps. It's great to have Richard back on the programme. On, on that, a lot of our listeners, I would have to acknowledge this now, a lot of our listeners would be, they would have, they would have supported or maybe still do support Trump and they believe that Trump meant a lot of what he was saying on the campaign trail um, you know 18 months ago or, or more but they're saying that what's happening with with respect to these investigations and Mueller, Robert Mueller and all of this stuff, it's to throw Trump, that Trump genuinely this is what many of my listeners would believe that he genuinely wanted to do business and to do good business with Vladimir Putin and, you know, maybe t take a different approach in the Middle East. But everything else that's gone on with Russiagate and all the rest of it has thwarted him 
and has kind of chopped him down to size a bit and it's made him think twice about what he can and what he can't do. So how, where are you on that? You know, a Republican yourself, do you go along with that, that all of these distractions have actually prevented Trump from doing that which he said he would do during the campaign? I think I think they're exactly right. Um, Trump every every time that he does anything that is the the least bit um, conciliatory with Russia, uh, he's immediately jumped on by all of these people, and they say, "Oh, this shows that you were colluding with Russia and so forth." Uh, you know. There, there are there are global oligarchs. Uh, you know, George Soros is sort of yeah. he comes to mind, but there are many others who, who have, uh, who are very sinister, and yet they they may not have sinister reputations, but their interest is in making money. Uh, and to me, uh, the Dow theory, the the the. Dow theory of foreign policy is that the great, the great sums of money are made in drugs, oil, and war. And of those, the greatest is war. Uh, there are just fabulous profits to be made uh, in, uh, in, in the slaughter of people and the destruction of nations. And uh, so... I do believe that uh, that Trump has wanted to normalize relations. I think he's wanted to downgrade uh, our our uh, aggressive pro-terrorist actions in Syria. Uh, but each time that he makes a declaration and says, <clears throat> you know, we're going to we're going. The last time he said, he said, we're getting out of Syria and we're getting out very, very soon. Well, within uh, a week or so, uh, they conducted, a, a, they basically portrayed a gas attack. The gas attack, from all that I can determine, never, never happened. The yeah. Duma gas attack. It, it actually did not occur. Um but uh, in very short order, he was pressured into taking action. However, if you look at what happened, <clears throat> I think he had a small voice in what was ultimately done, and they limited the targeting to three fairly innocuous targets. We spent a billion dollars. We, you know, we spend like uh, there's no tomorrow, but. But and we ended up killing three innocent uh, Syrians, but I think at least he constrained the attack to where it looked like we were doing something, and uh, and and he he kept it as limited as possible. I think that was Trump's part in the in the business is saying, okay, you guys get your way, but I'm not going to have some sort of a, a, a mass slaughter of Syrians. Now, that's credible, yeah. that, right? That, and and I'm, I'm prepared to entertain that, even though I, I, I'm certainly not a fan of Donald Trump, and I don't pretend to be, but I, I, I try to be fair. So I would entertain that. There are those listening to this who would be admirers of yours, and they would say, well, Dick might be right, but this guy... He still went along with it. He still said the embassy should be in Jerusalem. And he appoints Goldman Sachs bankers. And more importantly, he appoints people like John Bolton as his national security advisor. I mean, Richard, you must have been scratching your head when, when Bolton was... Um, because I know you're no fan of people like John Bolton and his ilk. That just leaves you cold, really. How does that happen? A, a, a president who says, right, let's dispense with interventionism. It's wrong. We shouldn't be the world's policemen. We shouldn't be making, we shouldn't be destabilising regions or making destabilised regions worse. And then he appoints John Bolton 
Richard, who's just, I hate to be so crass, but he's a madman, right? I mean, this is a madman who, if he was left to his own devices and he didn't have to get anybody's permission, he'd bomb half the planet. So how does he end up in Trump's administration? Well, it, it, it happened in a series of steps. Now, let me first of all say, if, if you made up a list of 100 potential national security advisors, um, unless John McCain were on the list, the last person that I would select as the NSA would be John Bolton. Yeah. He, it, I cannot imagine a worse person than him. Uh, he, he was uh, instrumental in uh, getting us to go to war against Iraq, uh, which has cost a million people their lives. Uh, and ultimately, you know, we've incurred seven trillion dollars out of our 20 trillion dollar debt uh, as a result of not only what we did in in Iraq, but uh, the various wars in the Middle East that flowed from it. So he's he's horrible. And uh, it began when, uh, you know, the president initially selected uh General Michael Flynn, who was a man of tremendous honor, intellect, uh, a man who recognized that that uh, we were we were driving off a cliff, and he wanted to to draw back from war and uh, and have a have a more peaceful world. He was he was ousted in a palace coup, and from that point forward. All of the structure he was putting in place in the White House has been disassembled step by step. And uh, this this was a great tragedy of the Trump presidency because uh, each each of the new uh, war war hawks that comes on uh, urges additional war hawks to be added to the cabinet. And so we've we've got. Uh, We've got uh, well. If you look, the most moderate person is is General uh, Mattis, and Mattis uh, ordered an attack on uh, on Russian troops uh, who were crossing the Euphrates River to to help to to liberate additional Syrian territory. They may not have been. Uh, members of the army, but they were, you know, they were black, Blackwater type uh, Russians, and they were Russian citizens. And General Mattis, personally, according to him, uh, gave the go ahead to uh, to slaughter them, killed a couple of hundred of them. Um, that now, to put things in perspective, Mattis is probably as as moderate as anybody in the cabinet. And yet that particular act was so dangerously reckless that uh, it, it's very reminiscent of uh, the things that were going on uh, that led up to, to the First World War, which then led into the Second World War and this massive slaughter of humanity in the last century, we we have people who are reckless to the point that they are willing to gamble uh, on, you know, some some gain that they might get out of a out of a local war here and there, uh, gambling that perhaps we might not uh, have a thermonuclear war as a result, but understanding that it is a clear possibility that uh, that it could happen. It's insane, isn't it? When you when you put it like that, and it's. It, I think the first time we spoke, we spoke about that possibility. Senator Richard Black is on the line, and our time is nearly up. And thanks for giving us so much of your time, Senator. Just before you you go, for me, democracy is an illusion. And, and I say that respectfully when I speak to you because I've watched you for some time and um, I know you're what we call an old school public servant, you know, who works hard for the people of 
your district and I know you do that and uh, you know t- testimonials um, they come thick and fast for you so I say that respectfully democracy democracy to me is an illusion I mean if 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 we really did live in a world where you know we did really get to select those men and women those presidents those prime ministers to serve the best interests of the people surely one of the things that would happen and this is this is a bit of a stretch of the imagination but surely the UK for example and France and Germany and even China and even Russia might say to the United States okay your behavior is destabilizing and is pushing us to a place that might result in a thermonuclear war so therefore we're going to sanction the United States now you might laugh when I say that but you know it staggers me that when the United States behaves and I know the United States is is just its government well it's far more than that but 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 you're not the president you don't agree with it but there isn't a lot you can do about what's happening with the Trump administration right now so what about the countries of the Middle East the countries of Europe and the Far East saying, right, we're going to sanction the United States. I mean, if, if it was a fair and just world, surely, Senator, that is something that would be on the table. What do you think? Well, I, I think at, at the heart of it, uh, the United States controls the global banking system. Uh, so long as we have uh, a, a unipolar banking system that is under the dominance of one nation, uh, every other nation will be secondary. Uh, ultimately, I think we need to have competitive banking systems which would reduce this uh, business of, uh, of the United States saying, well, we're going to sanction all of the the European countries if they don't knuckle under to the unlawful act that we're taking uh, in regard to the Iran nuclear deal. We we have we have no right. I mean, I can I can I think I could justify us pulling out of it. I can't justify us punishing other nations for observing a treaty that they have entered into uh, under under the auspices of the United Nations and the European Union and everybody else. And yet we say, well, we don't like it. And so we're going to punish you if you don't do what we're going to do. This is uh, this is evolving into a, a global uh, dictatorship, and I think that is always a bad thing. Senator, great to speak with you again. Thanks so much for coming back on. Really appreciate it and the work you do there in Virginia. Thanks so much. Thank you, Richie. I've enjoyed being with you. Great stuff. Senator Richard Black, live on the line to us from his office there in Virginia. Great to have him back on the programme. Do tweet um, your comments on that. It's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter, at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. It's exactly six minutes to the top of the hour. Uh, Quite a few coming in, by the way. Quite a few comments about Iran and the... There's a couple of articles today, one by Lee Camp, who presents a programme for RT. Uh, He's an old guest of mine, programmes I've done in the past, TV and radio, comedian in America. Uh, And he's been writing about today in the Huffington Post, I think, amongst others, about the fact that Iran was going to use euro, it was going to trade its oil using the euro, something that the Iraq government of Saddam Hussein was planning on doing as well. And people are saying today that's significant. Um, I don't know. It might very well be. Uh, hi to Moinga, to Mark Richards as well, uh, to Faisal, uh, to uh, JP. Uh, thanks, uh, JP, for the tweets and for the memes there. To Tony Allars as well. It's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. Cartoon drunk thing. He's a good egg, is uh, Senator Black there. Yeah, these are interesting times. It's interesting that when anybody talks about sanctioning the United States, well, we control the financial apparatus of the world. Therefore, it would be difficult to sanction the US and the US could then punish, uh, penalise any country that 
decided to take up against it and to move, you know, to, to, to propose sanctions against it. But if you really wanted it, and this is this is the point I'm making about it all being rigged, the whole system. You know, Netanyahu's presence in Moscow today, right? Netanyahu's presence in Moscow today must give you a clue. Even all of those listeners who really want to believe in Vladimir Putin and really want to believe that there is genuine opposition to the Zionist cabal, the Rothschild Zionist cabal, by the way, the tiny, tiny group of families. People want to believe there's genuine resistance and that genuine resistance can be found in Russia. I don't believe it. I've never believed it. And I give and have given credit to the Russian government for the position it's adopted in Syria, which has prevented the overthrow of Bashar al-Assad, which would have been a terrible thing. Without Russia's intervention, obviously the jihadists would now be in control and the country would be a basket case. So Russia and its government and its president take all the credit there. But don't fall into the trap of thinking that Vladimir Putin and his aides, cronies, friends, fellow politicians are somehow anti the Rothschild Zionist cabal plan the agenda. Because I don't believe they are. I really don't. Is what I believe.